Broadcasting from the campus of Salisbury University, this is WSDL Ocean City, NPR News Talk 90.7, putting Delmarva first. It's time for Delmarva Today with your host, Don Rush. Celebrating Shop Free Tax Week, and one of its biggest boosters has been the state comptroller, Peter Fancho. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. As parents prepare to return to school, Maryland has a new Republican governor, Larry Hogan, with a new emphasis on spending cuts and tax cuts. And on the Board of Public Works, he's often been joined by Comptroller Peter Fancho, a Democrat. Fancho has been on the Eastern Shore for the summer conference in Ocean City of the Maryland Association of Counties, and he joins us this morning. Welcome to the program. Don, it's great to see you and uh, delighted to talk to your listeners and uh, best wishes to everybody here on the shore. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about the the Maryland Shop Free Tax. How is that going? Uh, explain a little bit about it. I saw one figure, though, it says that Maryland loses, I think, like $6 million, I think, in, ta- in actual tax uh, revenue. How is that all working out? It's working out fabulously well. The... Uh, it's a, it's really a, an effort to tap into the psyche of shoppers in Maryland and get them excited about uh, purchasing items. Uh, so we passed the became law of, uh, several years ago, and it's a six percent sales tax exemption for our items of clothing and footwear. Um, any item that costs less than a hundred dollars, you don't have to pay the six percent sales tax. Here's the beauty of this concept: you mentioned the six million dollars in right. sales tax revenue that my office doesn't collect, but here's the deal: we collect seven million more in taxable item sales that occur because folks are going in to buy the tax exempt items. They have their wallets out. They see something else that doesn't qualify, but they buy it anyway. So. It's a wash for the state uh, as far as the sales tax revenue. It's a huge boost to mom and pop uh, retail establishments around the state. The large Targets and Walmarts and those folks, they like it too because uh, you really see the uh, consumer spending jump started. Why is that important? Maryland's got a $300 billion GDP, it's called state economy. 70% of it comes from consumers shopping. Uh, what happens during the summer? People get uneasy about the economy. They get into the dog days of August. They stop shopping. It's hard to get them ignited again. This tax-free shopping week, uh, which ends on Saturday the 15th of August, is a just a tremendous catalyst. And it's, I know, ideal in numbers, uh, as you mentioned, but uh, what we're talking about is the emotion of the uh, Maryland shopping shoppers, and they have they have money, but they're a little upset with the stagnant economy that we have, so they get to be cautious. Well, this is a way for them to get a deal. They come out uh, once they start shopping, they continue right through September, October, November, and uh, this week is going to be the second biggest shopping week of the year for the state in the dog days of August. Um, my personal pleasure is that I see a lot of Delaware license plates hmm. in, in Maryland shopping malls because folks want to get a deal. And the stores add on sales on top, uh, Don, so it's a long-winded way of saying this is a very uh, cost-effective, uh, smart, intelligent way to uh, move the state's economy forward and help small businesses and give our consumers a much-deserved break. By the way, how do you see the Maryland economy doing at this point um, in terms of revenues, in terms of its growth? In terms of revenues, the state budget's just fine. Uh, we have, uh, as you know, a huge number of tax increases and fee increases that have occurred over the last eight years. There's plenty of money in Annapolis for uh, the priorities that the state needs to fund. What is lagging behind is the real economy, the Maryland economy. It's just stagnant, and uh, that is a bunch of reasons. Uh, The international uh, situation with Greece and other countries, the national uh, economy is not doing that well, but 
Maryland didn't do itself any favors. Uh, in the last eight years, we created a lot of tax increases that became too much for consumers to really swallow and uh, resulted in the election uh, upsets that you, uh, you know, you referred to at some point. And um, so it's a, it's a situation where we have high taxes and not very good customer service in uh, the government. It, that's the perception, at least. I know it's a little bit unfair because uh, a lot of state employees and county employees work very hard. But the perception from the business community around the country is that Maryland's not a great place to uh, invest money if you have a choice because uh, it just uh, the business reputation is, is uh, lagging right now. In a word, the state economy in Maryland is stagnant. And that's a tra- tragedy because we need uh, employment growth. We need wage growth. Um, I think the election of Governor Hogan was a real shock to the Democrats, but I think actually it may be uh, a positive as far as as far as some of uh, the economy and correcting some of the perception that Maryland is not a place that's welcome welcoming to the uh, private sector. So uh, uh, there's hope down the road, but right now uh, a lot of pain and suffering. And you hear it when you talk to people who are uh, not, uh, well, who are subject to the fact that uh, consumers are right now reluctant to spend money. How much of this, by the way, is due to simply just the curtailment, as it were, of uh, federal government spending? There's been a certain amount of retrenchment in the sense of at least the expansion that we have saw over the certain last five or six years, sequester and so on. Because part of the economy, particularly for Maryland, just as it is, for instance, for Northern Virginia, is highly dependent upon the federal government and federal spending. That's not going as it, say, used to. Exactly. But it's still a huge asset for the state, the proximity to the federal government, the uh, federal jobs that a lot of people in the Washington area have. Uh, There's uh, yes, there's a slowdown because of sequestration. uh, And yes, we need to diversify the Maryland economy. But boy, that federal government is an absolute mover and shaker for uh, uh, our citizens. It's why the state is the most wealthy state in the country based on family income. Uh, So, yes, we need to reform things, uh, but I would attribute the the, uh, stagnation of our state economy right now to our poor business reputation, Mm. which, once again, I emphasize is a perception. It's often unfair, but perception becomes reality uh, in this area of development. And I think we have some real significant self-inflicted problems. Uh, I think we went overboard as far as tax increases. And uh, I think the casino gambling expansion has been a debacle for the state's economy. Why? We're talking billions and billions of dollars of discretionary spending vacuumed out of the pockets of Marylanders who were unfortunately uh, uninformed enough to go and lose tons of money to these casinos. And uh, that's only happened in the last four or five years, and it dovetails exactly with the uh, time frame where the state's economy began to slip. Well, along those lines, because we had a, the new figure out that's a, a billion dollars total for both lottery and casinos, uh, and as I as was looking at this, the lottery um, is uh, actually... Uh, has, has also incre- uh, has, has slightly down from what it was, but the casinos dramatically, obviously, from like $129 million in, in 2012 to $487 million in terms of revenues taken in, in terms of the, the amount of money being spent there. It sounds like there's a major increase in uh, that gambling sector, at least at this point. D- does that count as a success? Well, I, I don't share the same uh, crowing victory after mm-hmm. uh, that these, this headline uh, implies that the state gets a billion dollars in net profits from uh, the lottery and gambling. Uh, that is not a way to build a healthy economy. It's a tremendously unstable source of state revenue. And what's left off there is the $10 billion that has to be scooped out of people's pockets in order to come up with the $1 billion. And uh, so I, I think it's a fool's gold that we're chasing here and the idea that the state uh, pounds its chest and says, boy, we got a billion dollars in gambling revenue. Uh, first of all, uh, they don't spend it very well. 
obviously, because we have all these budget problems in Annapolis. Secondly, it doesn't go to increasing education. It simply supplants existing education dollars. And thirdly, it's a sleazy kind of business that, uh, frankly, we're doing a disservice to our citizens by uh, providing so much of it in the state right next to them. It's one thing to have to drive to a casino. Uh, that's ba- that's uh, at least got some protections in it because you have to get in a car and travel. When you've got these casinos wall-to-wall across the state of Maryland, it's, uh, well, it breaks my heart because uh, it's, uh, it's a terrible economic direction for the state to go in. I lost that battle a couple of times because people have voted... Uh, narrowly last time in a statewide <laughs> referendum but i think the folks uh, i think the citizens were duped over the whole thing by uh you know these claims of extra money for the state and uh, nobody ever talked about the downside uh, of gambling and hopefully i'll be around long enough to see them all chased back to las vegas i was gonna say by the way i've read across one actually one it's startling figure which is a uh, gamblers anonymous chapters in maryland that they've grown from 16 in 2012 to something around 31 percent. It's 31 percent. Uh, that is uh, for now. There seems to be a major jump. Do you think that the that the state is still just too addicted? And you want to chase them back to to uh, Las Vegas, but is that is that realistic? Are they just simply well, here look, to stay? Well, uh, look. Let's be honest. Gambling is an entertainment for a lot of people. I go and buy a lottery ticket every time, every once in a while when the uh, take gets particularly big i know i'm losing i'm wasting twenty dollars <laughs> because i'm never going to win but the lightning strikes right but the casino industry that we've brought in in the last five years this is a very recent development uh in maryland is uh funded so mostly by gambling addicts uh that's the way these big casinos generate uh their profits uh yes ordinary people go and and you know they they gamble under under a lot of control you know under self control, but the fact of the matter is that uh, most of the casino money that we're crowing about right now comes from about 150 thousand gambling addicts in the state, and these folks cause uh, just all sorts of damage to themselves and their families. Uh, we have ignored the uh, social impact of gambling, and everybody knows instinctively that we have more bankruptcies, more domestic abuse, more foreclosures, uh, more uh, broken up families and divorces uh, because of gambling. These gambling addicts spend themselves into oblivion. Then the state, in partnership, this is what galls me, the state, in partnership with Las Vegas companies, goes out and recruits another 150,000 of its own citizens to lure them into these uh, shiny new uh, slot machine casinos and just vacuum the money out of their pockets. And when they're completely used up and uh, destitute, kick them out the door. It is a disgrace what we're doing in Maryland. And it is... uh, you know, I the state right now is not giving the information to its citizens about the damage that's being done. But everybody knows instinctively, and people on the shore know also, that uh, when you introduce this kind of addiction, uh, it's like a heroin addiction. You inject it into the body politic, and you make it convenient for people. I just shake my head at uh, the great state of Maryland and the values of uh, you know wonderful Marylanders that have and the values for example of the shore and the lower shore I don't mean a I don't mean a couple of slot machines and a veterans organization or something I'm talking about these organized conspiracies to uh, rip off hundreds of thousands of Maryland citizens simply because uh, it produces more money for uh, bureaucrats in Annapolis. I mean, give me a break. Uh, well, you asked. I didn't mean to get on. I didn't <laughs> mean to right. get on my high horse. And uh, <laughs> but uh, it is a fiscal yeah. fairy tale that the state will uh, rue and is causing a lot of damage to our uh, wonderful citizens. But I'm uh, I'm only the comptroller. <laughs> only so comptroller. what the heck. Speaking of being a comptroller, you, of course, now sit on, of course, the the Board of Public Works with the new Republican governor, Larry Hogan. 
Um, and some have suggested that you become um, the new governor's best friend on that on that board. How do you how do you see your relationship with the current governor, as opposed to say the previous governor Martin O'Malley? What's the difference? Do you think? Well, I have a very positive relationship with Governor Hogan, and I have a strategic partnership with him on the Board of Public Works to provide two votes to control spending and control debt. And uh, why are we doing that? Uh, Both he and I, I believe, uh, but me particularly, for just speaking for my own interests, if we get our fiscal house in order, we're going to be able to invest in the things that are really important to the state. For example highway user revenues for areas like uh, the Lower Shore. I mean, it's a, it's a travesty that the uh, folks in Annapolis cut the highway user funds from $700 million down to $120 million. That's resulted in all sorts of damage to our local roads and uh, was money that was well spent. So uh, to the extent Governor Hogan and I limit spending and debt for things that don't work, and put it into things like highway user revenues that really benefit uh, the economy, uh, I've told him that I will, I will consider anything that is good for the state of Maryland. And, and uh, I'm very comfortable with that. I get a lot of pats on the back from Democrats for laying down the partisan sword and, and uh, working with uh, Governor Hogan to make the state better. There's plenty of time down the road to get involved in the campaigns again. Uh, That's not going to happen statewide for three years. And in the interim, I believe we need to do things that are common sense and make, uh, have rational uh, uh, support. And, uh, you know, it's it's just bad luck that uh, he got diagnosed with cancer and is in a situation where he's really on his heels. Uh, but as I said, I have a good relationship with him, and Democrats and Republicans all across the state come up to me and say, thank God at least somebody can recognize that the citizens uh, desperately want their elected officials to work together for the uh, betterment of the economy. And uh, I'm very comfortable, Don, with uh, uh, where it makes sense uh working with him to uh improve the finances of the state how does that contrast with with your relationship or how you viewed anyway uh the former governor martin o'malley uh, i mean some people suggested that that when that when you viewed spending at least currently in terms of uh uh what's been going on that that's out of whack or that, that some of the officials have been kind of cavalier about spending how do you contrast the two Well, I voted on over 18,000 contracts with Governor O'Malley, uh, totaling $85 billion. And I often put my hand up and said, I think this uh, particular project is ill-advised. I think it's a waste of taxpayers' money, and, and, uh, you know, we should not move forward on this. I was always outvoted two to one. Now I put my hand up and I say this is a waste of taxpayers' money, and if they only knew what we were spending it on, they would be as outraged as I am. Now I win two to one. So I would say it's night and day. Mm-hmm. By the way, speaking about about development and um, trying to develop the economy here, uh, particularly in Wacomico County, uh, we're talking about, uh, we'll be talking actually in another segment about trying to figure out how to bring manufacturing into Wacomico County. We've noticed that there's a large number of uh, industries that have left Uh, Some new industries, obviously, are coming in. How do you um, see the development of manufacturing, particularly in the Eastern Shore, and economic development? A lot of stuff, obviously, being done in downtown Salisbury, but nonetheless, are there any magic bullets? What's How how do you view that? Yeah, there's several magic bullets. You've got Salisbury University. uh, That is an economic catalyst and uh, a real economic engine for the Lower Shore. I'm delighted to see it growing. I was very pleased that... Two of their graduates, uh, Palmer Gillis and Tony Gilkerson, just donated a $4 million building in downtown Salisbury in the the Plaza Gallery building to the university. The university is a very, very important economic asset. It's as the federal government is an asset to Maryland, Salisbury University is an asset to Salisbury and the surrounding region. So that's 
uh, number one. And number two is that there are lots of enterprising individuals. I'm thinking of Thad Bench up in uh, Chestertown. You should get him to come down here. The man is an entrepreneurial genius. He's got a New York City uh, number one rated uh, public relations firm in Chesterfield that's beating all the big companies around the country, employing tons of people up there in Chestertown, and he's just bringing a new company into Cambridge that's going to employ a couple hundred people eventually. Bring Thad Bench down here and just, you know, clone him about 15 times, and you're going to have a lot of innovative uh, new manufacturing and other jobs uh, here in the region. What we've done is kind of just left everybody to themselves and said, well, maybe something will happen. It isn't going to happen on its own. We need to get uh, folks like Thad Bench, and there are probably a dozen people like him uh, here in the Salisbury region, and really figure out how to be a constructive junior partner to those guys in uh, bringing the businesses here. The businesses are out there. It's just that Maryland's viewed as an area or a state that is unwelcome or does not welcome uh, private sector capital. And um, so don't, let's not uh, torment ourselves with bringing back something that may never, happen, that may never be recreated. Let's just go get these entrepreneurs who are here already, bring them down, sit them in here, uh, you know, don't exclude uh, the Purdue family because uh, obviously we have a, you know, huge uh, investment uh, with them. And uh, but it's it's there. The bones are there. We just haven't got the leadership. Uh, didn't have it over the last eight years. Uh, that was a lot where we were able to exploit exploit uh, the natural uh, genius of the private sector, which is all around us. Uh, we just tend to treat it with icy indifference, Don, and uh, the state has got to stop doing that. I mean, so, so for those people who, for instance, a lot of folks here on the shore, and particularly in Salisbury, they're all talking about trying to develop manufacturing, trying to revitalize the, the local economy. And some have suggested, as you say, that uh, the, in the old industries, they've disappeared, they're not coming back. Some have suggested, for instance, high tech is is the sort of the new wave, as it were. How do you how do you get that into this particular region? Bring Thad Bench down. He's already done it. Mm-hmm. Literally, he's bringing a brand new business to Cambridge, Maryland, as I speak, and it's something he bought down in uh, Florida or something, and, and it's his creation. And it's on the reason I'm so high on mm-hmm. him, and obviously there are lots of other people like him. Uh, is that he's already done something very successful on the shore. And, yeah, there are certain things that uh, he does that really works. And, you know, he talks about high broadband, you know, uh, Internet stuff. That's a crucial ingredient and allows him to be on the shore and compete with uh, his competitors up in New York City. So bring those guys like Thad Bench together, find out what works, and uh, put the government in not as the entity that decides what to do because we don't know what to do in government. That's not what we're good at. We're good at being constructive junior partners if we get the relationship right. And then plug in the university, which is, a, as I said, a potential catalyst for uh, the lower shore. Uh, it already has been, but it has a lot more potential. I want to turn, by the way, to the, the events in, in Baltimore that we saw with the, the riots and the death of Freddie Gray. Um, what do you make of that set of events and this whole discussion that's now seemed to arise over the issue of race, uh, Black Lives Matter, for example, has become certainly a national movement? What do you think happened there in Baltimore, and how do you think that connects to the broader discussion that we're having? Well, the riots in Baltimore were terrible for uh, the state's reputation, obviously, uh, internationally. Uh, we got a huge um, dose of bad luck, I think, and just terrible impact on the uh, on the reputation of the state. But it, it kind of uh, settled down for a little bit. Then we had this enormous crime wave up in Baltimore where I think 120 people have been killed in the last three months. That's the highest three-month total of homicides in 45 years, 
I mean, 45 years ago, we had twice as many people up in Baltimore. And here we are with half the people, and we've equaled the uh, tragic uh, three-month uh, figure. So that crime wave has got to stop. Um, I don't know what the magic uh, formula is for the leaders up there, but those leaders need to get on top of it immediately because that crime wave, unlike the riots, the crime wave actually is damaging the Baltimore city economy. And that shows up in the uh, revenue figures that we have, and it potentially spills over into the state. But I'm more concerned just about uh, Baltimore. So in order to have a good economy, you got to have public safety. No public safety, no economy. That's just plain, flat out the truth. And right now, a lot of people uh, in the Baltimore region do not feel safe coming into the city to, what, what, well, let me see this. to uh, participate. I have been up there all yeah. over the place. I'm a huge champion for Baltimore. I say, come in, take advantage of the shop, tax-free shopping week, take advantage of the great restaurants. All I'm saying is uh, it's an uphill battle if every time you open up the newspaper there's uh, more uh, uh, frightening stuff about uh, homicides. But what do you say? What do you think that that the entire situation says in terms of race relations in the state of Maryland? I mean, it it seems to have brought forth a tremendous amount of uh, tension that at least surfaces, not necessarily wasn't there before. What do you, you've lived in Maryland? I mean, for a very long time. What do you think it means? I mean, you have to have. I mean, I know you're a comptroller, so you deal with the numbers. But just as a a citizen of Maryland. Citizen of Maryland, I am spending a lot of time uh, this month, next month, and the month after visiting every first responder I can uh, visit, every Maryland state police barracks, every National Guard armory, every county police, municipal police. I'm going there to say to the uh, brave men and women that are uh, talk about the fire department, EMS, and I'm presenting them with uh, Maryland Hero medallions that say, uh, as an elected official in the state of Maryland, we have your back, we want you to do your job, we want you to have public safety. Um, Without it, uh, we just, uh, we just, uh, well, it's it's an absolute necessity to have a uh, growing, healthy, high quality of life uh, and also economic growth, so. And, and the, and the I, I believe I, I believe that our um, you know our folks uh, that right now are our first responders mm-hmm. need our support as communities, as individuals, as uh, citizens of the state. And um, that's well, what my do you, view. I mean, what do you think of? What do you think then? How do you evaluate the relationship between um, the police on the one hand and the community on the other. That seems to obviously come under serious scrutiny in Baltimore, but moving outside of just the specifics of the particular case there, do we have a lot more to do? I mean, what is Well, what we is always that have more to do. I I mean, mean, obviously, it, public safety is something that requires professionalism and training and lots of restraint. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely in support of uh, whatever we have to do to make sure that our first responders are extremely sensitive to all the frustrations, et cetera, that are out there. And, uh, but bottom line, um, my view is got to have public safety. Can't risk uh, that. And to the extent we're, uh, to the extent that we're giving the you know, sense to our first responders that somehow we we don't have their back, that that I think is a huge problem. And uh, I'm personally going to make a big uh, effort to get out there and give them these uh, Maryland Hero medallions and say, you know what, go out and do your job, do it right, but go and do your job because, uh, you know, I mentioned the fact that there are that three month total of homicides in Baltimore, mm-hmm. which we're experiencing right now as we speak, Don, has not been seen since 1970. That's 45 years ago. And uh, thank you very much, but uh, whoever the heck is in charge needs to step in and 
fix that right now. It's damaging the state's economy. By the way, I wanted to ask you about the governor and how he's doing. He's, uh, I guess, halfway through his chemotherapy, I think, at this point. How is that, uh, how is that going? What's, what's his spirits been like? What's, what's that Boy, I, I tell you, he just, uh, he, he got dealt a bad hit. Yeah. And uh, he has some real bad luck because it's a serious disease. How he's facing it is uh, tremendous. I mean, he's courageous, he's brave, he's very public, very transparent. And uh, I think a lot of people uh, admire, may disagree with him on policies, but they admire his personal uh, strength and integrity in dealing with something which uh, I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. I mean, it's a horrible disease, and uh, he's got a very serious case. I believe he's going to get through it, but the treatment is almost worse than the disease because obviously it's very exhausting, and he you know, has a lot of public demands. He's got a very able lieutenant governor in Boyd Rutherford. I think both of them are handling themselves with uh, a, a great deal of poise. And, um, you know, I, I have no problem with saying to people, uh, you know, I, I keep him in my prayers. I hope he has a swift recovery. And uh, I find him to be uh, all business and uh, interested in improving the state of Maryland. And... As I mentioned earlier, I happen to be uh, uh, one of the few people who seems to be able to work with him on uh, many on all these issues that come before the Board of Public Works, one of which is procurement reform. I mean, for eight years, uh, I sat on the board and raised all these questions about lack of competition and lack of transparency and the fact that uh, taxpayers were getting uh, ripped off in these big state contracts and uh, the business community didn't like the procurement process because they felt the incumbent vendor won all the time. So it wasn't a level playing field. Now, then I, all I got was a deaf ear of, oh, well, you know, that's just, uh, that's just the way it is, Peter. Well, now it's new sheriff in town and uh, the procurement process is going to be significantly changed uh, within the next six to eight months, and it's going to benefit the state's economy. It's going to benefit the state's reputation. Taxpayers are going to like it because they're going to get competition. Uh, not, no more of these single-bid contracts. And it's just an example of where, uh, you know, Governor Hogan, uh, Republican, and Comptroller, uh, myself, who's a Democrat, you have two votes on the Board of Public Works. You can do something that improves the state and, you know, later people can go and campaign and say, vote for me. But in the interim, shouldn't we just govern? We've been speaking with uh, Comptroller Peter Francho. He has uh, been by, on the peninsula and he's been, of course, uh, attending the Maryland Association of Counties in Ocean City. And we appreciate you stopping by and uh, chatting with us. Don, you're fabulous to sit here and listen to me, and your your listeners are very patient, and I'm sorry if I filibustered a little bit, but these are important times, and they're big issues, and uh, boy, do I uh, appreciate your common sense and uh, everything that you bring to, the, uh, to uh, this wonderful station, and it's a pleasure to be on the shore. And of course, we hope for the best for, uh, for the governor as well. Well, keep him in your prayers. This has been Delmarva Today. I'm Don Rush. Thanks for listening. This has been Delmarva Today, a production of Delmarva Public Radio. Chris Rank produces and is our audio engineer. Don Rush is your host. For podcasts, visit our website, delmarvapublicradio.net, or subscribe to the Delmarva Today podcast on iTunes. Delmarva Today can now be seen on PAC 14. To view the schedule, view the Daily Times, or visit pac14.org.